welcome to TMG Tonight. Our guest this evening is Greg Freck, and Greg is a partner in HFO, a brokerage firm specializing in multifamily investment properties. Greg has been in the business for over 28 years, and he's one of the most respected brokers in our region. He currently serves on the board of Multifamily Northwest and is a host of his own show, HFO TV. Greg will be discussing the benefits and challenges of buying and selling multifamily investment property in today's market. Please join me in welcoming Greg Frick. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. How are you? Good. Surviving the uh, pandemic? Yes. Barely. Yes. Barely. Yes. Although yes. business is still pretty good, huh? Uh, we've been busy. Yeah, yeah, it's been very busy. Yeah. yeah. It's a, yeah. definitely put a unique uh, perspective on doing business and has been the it big sure thing, has. yeah. Right. yeah. So before we dive into the market, let's talk about let's talk about you a little bit. Sure. So why don't you tell us how you got started in real estate? You've been in it a long time. How, how did you determine this was your career path? I was a finance major in college and kind of got out and was looking at various options and knew some people in the industry and they said, you know, have you thought about commercial real estate? And didn't really want to go in the stock and bond route, so I decided to go on that and I worked for uh, CB Richard Ellis back in the early 90s and back then they would give you exposure to the office retail industrial multifamily and i kind of gravitated towards probably either industrial multifamily i think because of the uniqueness of the clients you have different kind of people involved and so uh, with finance uh, background i kind of leaned towards multifamily so that's yeah. kind of i got sort of been doing it since 92 wow. in this market yeah wow. yeah and so when did you start hfo we started hfo uh being two other partners started in 99 Okay. And again, just kind of specialize multifamily, Oregon and Washington, uh, do some mixed use, but again, multifamily has to be the driver. So right. pretty specialized in that, uh, in that arena. So, yeah. Well, and you've grown a lot in the last five years. I, you know, I get all, I get all your emails, right. but, you know, showing your listings right. and, you know, the, the news and all of that. So what's, what do you think is attributed to all that growth? Uh, like new people, new team? I think specialization has been a big thing. I mean, we're not trying to be everything to everybody. So when you can specialize and have your whole team specialize in one aspect of, you know, commercial real estate's a pretty broad arena. Uh, I think that's helped a lot. Uh, you know, very passionate about the industry and what we're doing. And then, you know, we've, we've collaborated from the beginning. There was a big sense of collaboration working together as a team. And I think that's been, uh, has been very beneficial for us in terms of market share and growth. So I think that's been the biggest, probably the biggest three keys. I mean, now everybody talks about teamwork, but we were, we were doing it back before, you know, back it was kind of, day. yeah. <laughs> so. so you also, I see on your website, you also have a program, you know, centered around build your legacy, right? Right. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was kind of an idea of looking at our clients, kind of what some of the advantages is and why people get into multifamily. And again, we don't do the management side and the, we're just strictly on the kind of the brokerage and ownership side. So, you know, why do people get in? Why are people getting into multifamily real estate? Why are they investing? And you know, it's kind of the builder legacy for themselves their family you know different reasons but kind of looking at it like that like kind of a long-term approach so 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 tell me about your first deal you must have been just maybe with cb richard ellis at the time uh and... first apartment deal was a little deal over on 60th and gleason i mean it was a family and had owned it for they'd owned it for 10 or 15 years and wanted to kind of slow down their managing and so it was kind of an introduction i think it was a 15 unit i just remember it all had two bedrooms so it was a you know and back then it was I was telling somebody the difference now is just kind of the way we do due diligence, the way financing works. Um, it's been kind of enlightening in terms of how it's changed the last 10 years. So it's gotten it's gotten more complex. Uh, more complex, uh, but then also probably more streamlined. Mm -hmm. uh, how lenders look at it. Uh, with COVID, it's much more complex on due diligence. Is, I mean, that's yes. been the, people ask the difference between COVID and, you know, like the financial crisis in 08, 09. You know, the issue now for us is now like doing due diligence. I mean, we can get money, we can get financing, but it's actually physically doing due diligence. Can I get into units? Can we post? We don't, you know, same stuff right. you guys have been doing. Yes. So that's yes. been a unique, I mean, we've done some transactions where we've gotten into 10% of the units, right. you know, pr prior to close, which we would, you know, which uh, was unheard of two years ago. Yeah. Well, I've even noticed appraisers too that are appraising properties that they actually won't enter the units. Right. Um, and right. So you know, I think that's been a challenge a little bit too. So. Oh, we're leaning on management companies. Yeah. You know, do you have interior photos? Yeah. 
because the appraiser, the lender can't get in now. It's it's a bunch, yeah, it's a very uh, different world in terms of how that's going to deal with it. Yeah. So what about things like delinquencies, since we have the eviction moratoriums, both states, mm -hmm. um, delinquencies are there. Um, some properties are faring better than others. Yes. And so do you have do you have deals that are kind of waiting in the wings for something to change on that before they we, close? Or we had a bunch of projects uh, the way our, we had a bunch of projects that were to come to market first quarter or in, you know, end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter. And a lot, some of those we just waited. And that was right when it, everything happened. Everybody was unsure what was gonna, you know, lenders were a little unsure. And we said, you know, let's just wait and see. As we went through summer and started bringing some to market, it's weird. Some buildings are fine, some are not in terms of delinquents. It's not across the board where I could say it's, you know, older properties in this location. Literally, we can have a building that's fine and right next door it's not. It depends on tenant mix, management. Um, as we've gone further along, you know, lenders are maybe doing some holdbacks, uh, it's, but it's definitely a question. I mean, we've got buildings that have higher delinquencies or higher vacancy. You know, we may have to lay it, may extend closing. So it's, it's been unique, but like I said, it's not individually where I can just say, oh yeah, this part of town has a bunch right. of delinquents. Right. It's literally management, building by building, can be completely different. Because I've seen that the percentages, Washington seems, is, at least Clark County is doing a little better on yes. the delinquency side yes. than, than Oregon, particularly yes. the city of Portland. Yes. Um, and But occupancy is pretty high, actually. You know, right. when you look at the seasonally, we just haven't had the move outs um, in properties that we typically experience during the summer. Um, so I guess even though some people aren't paying, having it having a higher occupancy is still good. Good, right, but, right. Uh, that that definitely. Has it's been kind a of the flip. You know, we'd have people that are. You know, you have a higher occupancy, but then if we have a higher percentage of people not paying, right? Then we're running into this issue. You know, when are they going to pay? Can they pay? Do they need help? And I, we'll tell. You know, we've talked a lot about this whole COVID thing. Is the issue we've had is there's no means testing for. For tenants, so I've got if I have tenants taking advantage of it, uh, then I, as an owner or a you know management company, I can't help the person that really needs help, and so I think that's the part where I, you know, I you would hope that people kind of see it's all connected, um, but it's that's been kind of we've been trying to educate some of the politicians is, look, owners don't want to have their building vacant, right. but when you have people taking advantage of the system, who have gotten money or still have their job, and then I have somebody that really needs help, I can't do that if I've got. You know, if I've got burden with this other thing. So it's been an education process. A lot of people don't understand, and you, you know, as a management, how our industry works. Right. And, you know, yeah. they, just, they just think, oh, well, we get rents and everything's hunky-dory and don't realize how it's all kind of layered up, so. Well, and, and you know, we work with, uh, you know, the different organizations that, right. you know, have received money. Um, right. And, you know, that, that process isn't working as well as any of us would like. I think we thought when that happened, both, you know, in Clark County and in Portland, that, you know, that once the, once the organizations received the money specifically for rental assistance, right. that, okay, there was a process in place and we were, you know, things were, were going and tick through it, but that's not happened. People have been on waiting lists, even they, even though they say they're approved. Um, but there's no, you know, there's no forward movement. We've actually seen a slowdown compared to right. you know, three weeks ago. And I think Washington's even better in Oregon. It is, yes. I um, mean, Oregon had yeah. what, forty uh, was a couple of weeks ago, like thirty to forty percent of their unemployment claims were unprocessed. That's right. And then you had, in terms of relief, we had, I think it was Multnomah County, so they want to hold off on getting COVID relief money out till October. Right. So then we had all through the summer, we're saying, wait, you've got people that. Got a stimulus check back in March of, you know, maybe they're laid off, don't have a job. What are they supposed to do and wait? So it's, it's, uh, it's not, you kind of wonder as you're looking at some of the solutions, are they really concerned about the tenants or is this kind of a political game? Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's, right. that's probably been the most frustrating thing because then they put the burden on, you know, property owners and everybody else to kind of handle this as they're doing whatever they do in Olympia and Salem and D.C. So, well, yeah. you know, the, the eviction moratoriums, as you know, are scheduled to, you know, end at the end of the year. Yeah. And so, Not yes, we'll see. yes, I, yeah. I hope that happens. I think a lot of clients or a lot of owners are, you know, they can make it through. I mean, they'll right. deal with it. Um, but if it goes too much longer into 2021, it truly will become a major problem. Oh, most all definitely. Over and almost right. at the same time. Right. Um, so which we're seeing in. Uh, you know, I think a lot of owners said, okay, we're going to hold back distributions and we're going to, you know, preparing for this, right. but not no, thinking if it goes over to January, I mean, it will be similar to what you're seeing in commercial where the eviction moratorium is, you know, not as long and you've got tenants that are, you know, closing businesses and things right. like that. Right. We get in that in the housing industry, this is going to be an issue. Yeah. And like I said, the money's not coming out that's been allocated from COVID to 
agencies and then dispersing that out, you're really not, it's not, it's not getting in the tenant's hands. So that's been the biggest issue. Well, yeah. you know, it's been going on since March 1st. And so, uh, yes, exactly. you know, we're just, yeah. I, I don't think any of us ever thought that, that it would go, that it would go on that long. No, and I thought there would be, I thought it would, there would be better ways to get money through the system. I right. mean, I know, I think it was in Portland, they gave people gift cards for $500 as a way for an assistance, right. which sounds great. And I'm not laying, but you know, you can't pay rent with a gift card. And, you know, and again, if you've got, and there are definitely, you know, as I said, landlords and property owners want to help typically that we're not looking to vacate buildings. Uh, but when you have people taking advantage of it, it does limit your ability to help people that really need help. And that's yes. the sad part because, you know, yes. at the end of the day, we try to hopefully everybody work together and fight this together. But it just seems from a political standpoint, the burden they've put an inordinate amount of burden on property owners. Uh, to fix some of these societal issues as opposed to kind of spreading it out for everybody. So so if, if putting COVID aside, mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about investment, it, investor strategies, right. do, you, do you think, do you think, especially first time investors or not, maybe new investors, do you think they need to have a strategy? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to have a strategy or at least a goal and understand, I mean, have some expectations and where you want to go and, you know, and understand why you're doing it. You may not know because it's, you're new to the business or new to getting into this but kind of open it up to explore, you know, what the different options are and kind of where you think it may go. Now you may get an educate yourself that maybe this isn't the best, you know, vehicle. We've had people that I want to get into real estate, but I want to be completely hands off. Okay. Well then do you want to look at third party management? Well, I don't, that's not what I want to do. Okay. Well then maybe multifamily is not the asset for you. So it's kind of working through kind of what the goals are, where they want to go and then kind of formulate a strategy. From there. So what? So what about diversification? Is that something that you talk to your clients about? Oh, yeah. Meaning, you know, different. There's different property types, mm -hmm. right? You just talked about industrial, right. retail, multifamily, geographic locations. Right. You know, I know even a couple of our clients, we had, they're saturated in a particular area. Um, you get too many units there, and you're competing against yourself. Right. So that's a tough go. Or you so get the economies of scale here all together, but like you said, you're are you cannibalizing yourself? Right. On uh, you know fighting for the same tenant, that becomes an issue. I think a lot of it has to do with experience and again, kind of what the long term, the goal is and kind of how big is the, you know, how big is their, what do you want to call empire, what they're trying to do as to where they can go. I mean, we have people now, you know, thinking about, you know, where am I going to retire? What, you know, what state am I retiring in? Do I want to have assets in a state where I'm not a resident? And do I look, looking at that? So, and then it becomes too planning about, you know, your heirs and your legacy. Am I giving this to my children? Am I giving it to a charity? What does that look like? What's the easiest way to do that? So, and it can change as you go along, but we definitely talk about diverse scale. I mean, we're biased towards multifamily because uh, that's what we do. Uh, from a risk profile, you know, it's typically kind of the lower risk. Hence, sometimes the returns maybe aren't as great as, you know, if you do a standard office or something like that. But I think there's a reason and a balance for that. So, yeah. So, so our, so if somebody calls, if somebody calls your office, maybe mm -hmm. they received information on one of your listings and, you know, either they, they own a small, you know, a small property, maybe they just have, have had one purchase under their belt. Um, what, what are some things you ask them right off the bat? Um, well, we'll get a lot of calls from uh, people that don't even own in our market and asking about, hey, I'm out of California, you know, as right. we get to send the migration up. And kind of the fir first thing is kind of what are you looking for? And then make sure that their expectations are in line with the market. I mean, if I've got somebody calling and saying, hey, I'm looking for the, you know, the great deal and I want a 10% return out of the gate, we're like, you know, that's great, but you may want to head, head east, you know, go to the Midwest and you can maybe find that. You're not going to find that in these you know, on the West Coast and these gateway cities. So c making sure their expectations are in line with, you know, kind of where the market is. I mean, everybody wants to find the great, you know, great home run deal, but uh, again, those are a few, and they're, you know, they're not, there's not a lot of home there's run There's not an information's anymore. readily available now, right. so that the idea behind that's really not, so I mean, if that's what you're looking for, great, more power to you, hope you can find it, but, you know, it's, if you're realistic on what your expectations are, and the reason why you get in there, that's what we'll kind of talk about, yeah. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Here at AMS, we've been successfully managing your communities for over 30 years. And in that time, we've seen pretty much everything. That's not good. Oh my gosh, Chip is back again. What are we going to do? Yeah, he was on my lawn too. Don't worry, I know what to do. No! At AMS, we know association management. It's literally in our name. 
Let us handle the pains, management, financials, and so much more for your association community. Contact us today to get started. Really? 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 Hi! Yeah! Homeworks. Installs, repairs, routine improvement. We keep your home working. All right, we're back talking to Greg Frick about multifamily investment properties. And we're going to dive into uh, when somebody makes an offer sure. and talk about the due diligence. So okay. kind of walk us through that process. Well, typically, if you've identified a property that works for a client, they put an offer in, and let's just assume the negotiations are, are through and it's accepted, then they, they've got a due diligence period. Uh, depending on the, the market and the timing, it's usually anywhere from... I mean, 15 days to 30 days to kind of do their physical due diligence. Because a lot of times, one of the unique things in multifamily is a lot of times you're not able to get into units prior to making an offer. So you're making an offer based on, you know, an offering memorandum that's put together. Maybe we were able to get, you know, with the management company, get into one, but we haven't seen them all. As opposed to, you know, buying a commercial building, you know, you're able to kind of walk in during business hour, look at it, and you're... Your due diligence, a lot of it has to do with the leases, whereas in multifamily, a lot of the due diligence really has to do with the physical aspect of the property, because again, your leases are turning over. Uh, do you do you, do your buyers want to get into every single unit? How does how does that work? I mean, you know, in a in a perfect world, uh, you know, some of it too is driven by their management company. I mean, we'll try to get them involved in their, you know, if they've got third party management, you know, like you know the management group does, we would say, great, get them involved early on the due diligence. I mean, as uh, we've talked to management companies, the worst thing they can have is, hey, I just closed on a deal, can you take it over tomorrow? Right. You know, right. get them That's in tough. early. So and part of that is, yeah, they'll say, maybe we're not having the inspector go to every unit, but maybe we want to just peek eyes in every unit just to get a sense. Um, and it's, it depends on properties too. Sometimes we'll post on every unit. No, this is kind of pre-COVID. Post right. on every unit. And then, you know, we're in and we end up seeing 25%. Oh, we want to make sure we see an upper and a lower and different. So there's different ways to going that. So that's the physical side. You know, we're, you know, giving them recommendations and helping them in terms of inspectors or specialists. Hey, we need to go look at the roof or, you know, different components of the building. And do, you, do you recommend those yeah. resources? Yeah, we can. Yeah, just because we've been doing it so long, know a lot of the players that have been doing that. And again, it will work hand in hand with their management company uh, in terms, you know, as we'll always say, the management company is going to have to live with it in terms of, you know, where they think they can rent it, it, you know, different things, plans for the building, have that kind of discussion up front. Uh, so we'll, we, you know, facilitate that um, and go through there. So that's kind of the part of the physical side. And, that, and that's about a 30 day, you left 30 yeah, day. Yeah, give or take, yeah. yeah. Just depending on, the, depending on the asset, depending on some of the other factors, you know, is there a financing contingency, is there not? Right. We've done some where there's no financing contingency, so maybe the Due diligence is stretched out a little bit. Uh, they may get a loan, but it's not contingent. So there's just depends on. But you can, and again, COVID makes it a little bit different because again, we don't know how many units we can get in. We can post. And people can refuse. And people, people can, can refuse. Just say, exactly. You know, you know, yeah. Whether they're sick or not doesn't right. really matter. Right. They can refuse and entry. It, yes. So that's made. That's that's what's made 2020 kind of unique in terms of the front end. In oh in oh nine and oh ten, it was a financing issue. There wasn't money being lent at all, and so the market just kind of from sales just kind of sat for a while. There's money out there; it's cheap money. I mean, it's you know you're oh, rates talking are, rates are unbelievable. unbelievable. I mean, yes, high twos, low are. threes. Right. It's the physical due diligence part that's is is really kind of you know really having a lot of conversations with the existing management company. You know, can we get in? Do we know how many units can we get? In? We don't want you know we want to make sure when we do an inspection, that only one person's going in the unit at a time. Yes. They're fully Everybody masked masks exactly. Yes. So. That's been the unique part on that. Uh, and then in financing, you're working with the, the buyer in terms of if they've got an existing relationship, great. If they don't, we can kind of set them depending on, again, what their goals are, what their expectations are, what's the best program, what are different lenders to look at. Do, do buyers often have, a, have they already been to their lender prior to you? Sometimes? Some have and some have. As they've got more experience, they typically will have an existing relationship. Right. Uh, sometimes the, the money they're using to purchase came from a refinance out of an existing. New new borrowers uh, or new buyers sometimes not so that's kind of an introduction. We'll get a lot of uh, 
buyers from down, you know, California has always kind of driven this market right. in terms of, so a lot of times we'll say, hey, I understand you've got a relationship with somebody down there. It may benefit you to use somebody who's more experienced up here so you're not, you know, having to educate that lender the on market. the market is. Right. You know, what's Vancouver? What is that? You know, so right. we'll sometimes kind of push to that. It's It just makes the process a lot uh, easier to work through. So, so what about the lending environment? I mean, rates are good mm -hmm. and there is money available. Right. Have you seen a tightening, though, of uh, criteria, perhaps? Or yeah, we've seen, you know, lower LTVs than what you used to see. Mm -hmm. I mean, multifamily is never really ultra aggressive in, in uh, LTVs. Even back in the credit, you know, in the, the recession back in 8 and 9, you know, we didn't have a lot of multifamily that went back to the lender. I mean, the ones that did that I know, in, you know, in this market, it was more of a management ownership issue, not necessarily the asset. Right. Uh, so what you're seeing now is, you know, your LTVs are getting a little, you know, you need more equity to come in. There are doing some reserves depending on the lender and how much of a loan they'll, you know, some lenders are doing a six month or eight month, 12 month kind of reserve to protect them from COVID. We are, you know, we're getting asked, you know, basically every week or every other week, you know, what are collections, what's delinquency? Because as you know now, as we've seen since summer, we used to pull a, you know, a, a rent roll or collections on the 10th or the 15th. Right. Now we're just we now we'll we'll pull it for the previous month because you know with what's going on you know rents are coming in through the whole month. Right. No so, late fees can be charged. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. People... So we'll pull a report on the eighth, and it's like, oh my, oh shoot, this building's right. you know I'm like okay, let's look at what was the previous month. So that's right. that's been kind of different on the financing. So it's there. Uh, you know, we have not seen you know cap rates go up with COVID. If anything, they've stayed steady in some right. regards, even maybe gone down a little bit because of interest rates. Right. I mean, that's what's really driving and the amount of capital looking to invest in this market. Because the, the values have not dropped at no. all. I mean, no. it, they, they've been on their way up for a while, right. Right? right? And so now, that do you think they're just stabilizing or do you think I they're I think they're still... stable. I mean, what we're seeing on underwriting, you're not able to push rents up. I mean, if right. we're looking at an asset, I can't say, oh, we're going to put a 10% rent increase, you know, on turnovers there. So that's stabilized kind of your projected income. But when you're looking at the interest rates, I mean, I think that's offsets. So cap rates have stayed pretty steady. I also think, you know, in our world of multifamily, you've got capital that maybe was looking at office in retail, now looking for yield. And so now you've got, cap, you know, as you get more capital looking for investments and in yield, you know, that's going to keep, uh, you know, if they're coming into multifamily, you've got more demand. So that'll keep cap rates down. Are you, are you having your sellers, you know, hold a little bit to see what happens? It's a, you know, saying, it's, hey, we're at the top of the market, let's do it Yeah, now. no, I mean, some are looking, you know, some, it depends if they've had it for a long time. Some are looking at it like, the, you know, some been depreciated out. Uh, some are looking at other markets diversifying. You know, do I want all my assets in, you know, this city or something like that? Can I, uh, if you've got refinance funds, you know, are they looking for other assets to go into? We have some that are doing estate planning. And so then the question becomes about, you know, state taxes and where am I going to retire? What am I going to leave to the kids? What's the easiest way to do that? So there's always that that's always going on, regardless of what's happening in the, um, you know, in the economy. There's all, you know, those things. So that's always driving some sales. Um, yeah. And then others are, hey, I've, you know, had it for a while. It's been a great run. You know, maybe I need to start looking, you know, politically, there's some questions on, uh, you know, on the tax situation. You know, are we going to see changes in the tax code? Do we see, you know, there's always talk about 1031s going away, but we'll see if that's actually going to go. But, you know, if that changes. So, again, as you're making a plan for your estate and your legacy, you have to start factoring that in. So you'll see some of that selling going on. Yeah. So, so when you, uh, specifically with the city of Portland, because, you know, they have so many restrictions oh, yeah. and so many, yeah. you know, the fair access. I mean, they, they have they just layers and layers on there with yeah. requirements that landlords and management yeah. companies I think Portland and Seattle are fighting as to which yes. one's going to be the, yeah. Yes. yeah. And, and it's, it's pretty crazy just trying to keep up with, with all of the new laws to make sure that you are, as a management company, right. make sure you're abiding by those. So, so our clients, our clients seeing that? Are oh, yeah. They, are they saying, hey, you know, maybe I don't want to be in the city. Oh, no, we've had definitely a lot of that, a lot of that where I've, you know, I've been in for a while. This is, this wasn't my idea when I got into this, you know, vehicle from investment. I was just, you know, trying to help myself and help my family. And, you know, now we've been, you know, looked at as the bad guy and villainized. And so maybe it's time to get out. So, yeah, there's definitely, you know, it used to, we used to have a little bit of that. Oh, from a tax standpoint, I, maybe I want to get out of Oregon and, you know, get you come across Washington or something, come tax. Uh, but now you've got, you know, I don't want to deal with this in Portland. Uh, we're seeing a lot of owners that you know maybe don't have management that's the other question that's coming up now because we'll say with everything that's on board from fair access to everything uh you really <laughs> you really need to 
you know, this is not what you, this is not something you want to do on the side. If you know, either hire somebody to help, bring management in, or something, because the pitfalls are are greater, the penalties are worse. So yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of clients looking to you know get out Especially of Portland. I would say some of the smaller landlords, oh, you know, yeah. that, you know, twenty. 25 units. Right. I mean, that's like, right. that's a tough go, especially yeah. if you have people not paying, how you serve the notices. Or even just how you're doing renting. I mean, I've, yes. I mean, and even just for fair. You know, the increases. I mean, are you advertising for 72 and, hours? Are you doing, yes, I mean, all that stuff yes, is just, yeah. It is. And again, we always say it's, you know, from a political standpoint, who are they really trying to help? And is it really doing it? I mean, if anything, they've now put so many restrictions. You've got property owners and management companies. They can't get out of the, they, they can't, somebody really needs a special assistance. They can't do that for fear of being, you know, getting some kind of trouble. So it's it's really been kind of sad to see, but, you know, it's kind of the world we're in now. You know, I wonder if, and, and we've not talked about this before, but, you know, when you have buyers coming up from California, California has, uh, you know, a lot of restrictions, right. you know, statewide, plus the individual cities and counties. Do you think that they're not as, when they're looking at a property, say, in the city of Portland, do you think they're they're not as concerned, perhaps? Well, they've, um, they've lived they've it. Yeah, it? they've lived it, so they've seen it, they've experienced it, so they're not as, uh, yeah, they're, it's not as you know, kind of a biggest concern. I think a lot of people coming from California with, you know, from wildfires to all kinds of things uh, from a tax standpoint of also just kind of looking, you know, do we really want to be here? Is it worth being in the state? Right. So they're still coming up here and they, well, you know, it's bad up here, but it's not as bad that or as potent. There. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So, or is that, again, that's why you're seeing, I think, a push to Idaho because uh, it doesn't feel like it, that's been there. A, uh, Spokane, right. uh, you know, one thing I've noticed is Oregon seems to be driven a lot by politics from Portland. Uh, Washington State does not seem to be driven quite as much by what's going on in Seattle through the state. So that's, that's been a, right. a unique. Right. So we are seeing people looking more in Washington and going maybe east. So And there, there's a lot of people moving east. I see oh, that, yeah. you know, just just, you know, whether it's investors, but just residents, yep. you know, trying to get out of out of the, you know, the metropolitan right. areas. So when we talk about like the downtown core of Portland having nothing to do with really the city of Portland's, you know, uh, restrictions, mm -hmm. but they just want to do the tenants are just wanting to move yeah. because they just need more space right some of them are in you know 425 square feet and you know especially if they have a roommate that's pretty darn small well and everything built you know new construction built it's you know they, they're building smaller units they because are. of right. you know density requirements and things like right. that and it just didn't it, it's tough to build a you know a, a tower with two better units right. I mean, you can count on your hands how many you know, three better units, new construction we have downtown. It's very, very limited. Because we're, we're actually seeing people, you know, in that downtown core that are paying, you know, a significant amount of rent and they haven't actually, they, they have always been downtown people, right? right. I mean, that's been their, right. their atmosphere they right. like. And so now, now they're able to go, wow, look, at the, we could, we could rent a house or we can rent a three bedroom apartment for what we're paying here. Um, and so we, we, we see, yeah. we see that starting to eat. And as you don't have the benefits of downtown, I mean, if you don't have restaurants, you don't right. have theater, yes. you don't have shows, I think then the question becomes, why am I down here? You know, and if I'm not working downtown, right. I mean, that's the other thing, you know, you talk to people in the office world. I mean, if you don't have to go downtown from an office standpoint, is there an advantage to live downtown if then the other benefits of that? Now, again, is that short term, long term? Okay. Right. You know, it'll be it's that'll be kind of interesting to see. But I do think you're seeing some people going for why I wanted to be downtown. If I don't have that, can I look at a, you know, a smaller town that's maybe has a cute little down, you know, little right. street, main street. And right. so, yeah, right. it, what we say is all the time. It's really is a good time to sit down and kind of think about your plan and what your, you know, maybe it's not your exit, but what does the, you know, one, two and five year road look like? Because if it's either. Yeah, great. If somebody calls and they want to sell, great. Or buy, that's it's great. But, you know, we've advised a lot of clients, maybe it's not the best time to do that. Maybe you really should be looking at refinancing. Are there capital improvement items that need to get done on the project? This might be a great time to take some money out, put it towards that, and, you know, you lock in your interest rate for the next, you know, seven to ten years, and you've eliminated that interest rate risk. I mean, I don't think we're going to have rates going up anytime soon, but, you know, one never knows. Um, in terms of what happens long term, the interesting thing will be what some of the dynamics that have changed in 2020, you know, what ones are permanent and which kind of go back, to, you know, do we get back to the median? That's going to be tough to tell. I mean, I was reading something today. You know, I think a lot of businesses that were on the brink from restaurants, you know, maybe COVID just kind of fast-tracked, you know, them going out or things like that. But, you know, is the working from home, you know, what is that? Because now I think businesses, and we are, you know, the collaboration's tough. It's tough to it do that. From tough. I mean, it's hard to get culture. It's how hard to onboard people and what's that balance so that's going to be the interesting part have you have you, have you found that uh any of your crew at the office have they decided hey 
working from home, I, I got I to gotta come into the office and oh, yeah. see people. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Especially, you know, as a team, when we're trying to team and collaborate together, it's, yeah, it's very, I mean, Zoom's great. We use it all the time. And what I've told somebody about Zoom is it seems like the meetings are shorter because you're on Zoom and so it's more structured, but I probably have to do a couple more Zoom meetings than what I would have had to do just sitting together and hashing something out. Maybe it takes, you know, an hour and a half to do that as opposed to two hour Zoom, two separate one hour Zoom right. meetings. So that part, I think there's some positions that work great at home. I mean, and just, you know, less distractions are able to do that. It just depends. But, you know, in our world, uh, you know, it's tough because, you know, you want to go look at, build, you know, go look at assets. How are we going to, you know, what are the capital improvements we need? So it's been, uh, it's been tough. How much of that's going to stay, we'll see. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much oh, for being on our show tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. We appreciate all your insight, and I know our viewers appreciate all the good advice. So thank you, Greg Frick. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks.